We're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 3. I've been getting a lot of questions about and concerns from people who are struggling to lead their lost loved ones and family members to salvation. The reason why is because they know so much of Bible-believing truth. Now, you know what happens when you know so much truth. It becomes more divisive. They go further away from you. That's what happens. The reason why is because we know so much truth and our words and action and every day we live is gonna be contrary to what the world does. That's what you gotta realize. So a lot of people are broken hearted and they wanna know how to lead their, peop their family members to Christ. What are they going to do? So you try to give them the gospel, you try to show them Bible believing truth, but they reject you, they think that you're crazy, right? I, mm -hmm. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you had loved ones and family members thought you're just crazy, yeah, yeah, <laughs> she really thinks you're crazy, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, everyone thinks that. So you got to realize this, is that what you need to do are six steps. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3. This is the most important one, all right? And one of the most powerful ones. So it'll be appropriate to put this as number one. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we will read verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Now notice, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, amen, yep, they do that with you, look at this, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse what? Your good conversation in Christ. What's the most important thing is testimony. I cannot stress that enough. Reason why people will be more soft-hearted to listen to you is when they watch you. They're going to be watching you and what they do is that they shame you, they think you're crazy, they speak evil of you. But trust me, everyone has a conscience and because everyone has a conscience, it really bothers them when you have a good testimony. And the way that you act, talk, and live, the Holy Spirit's gonna show them more and more and more, and they're, they're going to be even more impressed with you, and they'll even eventually, uh, you'll eventually win their respect. So at least that much will be shown. And when they do that, then eventually the Lord can probably bridge the gap where they might ask you how to get saved. Not only that, because they see every day how you live, so that's why it's important that you go to church faithfully, you better be careful how your testimony is around other people. The reason why I'm stressing that is this. They're speaking evil of you as evildoers. They're going to watch and the world, I cannot stress how much, especially because we all are in the internet, the world will be so nitpicky. Yeah. I mean, how many preachers now have to censor what they say? It's, it's totally upsetting. But the, the world's going to be doing that, especially since the liberal ideology and wicked thinking and influence is seeping in so many people's minds. They're going to put you at a higher standard compared to atheists who are living more loosely and wickedly than you. That's how it is. So when they see you skip church, skip prayer, or do a cuss word and all that, you know what they're going to be doing? Oh, I thought he said that that was a sin. Oh, I, trust me, because I've seen families in churches where they don't come to church faithfully and they pray for their loved one to get saved. And then the family member asks them, why aren't you at church that day? And then there are family members who've been faithfully serving God and praying. And guess what? The lost family member that we thought was impossible to get saved, the person did get saved. I've seen that. Don't think that almost 10 years in the ministry, I didn't see that. I've seen it. Testimony makes a big difference. So this is the most powerful thing. So make sure they see a clean testimony out of you. That way uh, you can win their respect so they can be ashamed. Second thing, which is obvious, is prayer. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. It is extremely important that you pray. If you don't pray, then why bother? Why bother even try witnessing? You gotta pray because without God in it, then the ability of your own flesh is not gonna make it any better. Now look at Matthew chapter five, and this is 
what's really important with what God does with his children. And what he is is that because he's a great father who will hear the prayers of his children. And when he hears the prayers of his children, what he will also do is that he will give good things to them that ask him. Why? Because he is your beloved father and you are his beloved son. We're going to look at Matthew and it's going to be chapter 6, excuse me. It's going to be chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, and then we'll read what the Bible says right here. In verse 8, be, be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye even ask him, right? So he knows exactly what you have in your heart, what you want God to answer. So because of those things, you'd be surprised how many times the Lord he will be good in answering your prayers. So that's why it's extremely important that you got to be praying for people. Why? Let's also look at 2 Peter 3. So we saw Matthew 6. Let's also look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Does God want your family member to burn in hell? Obviously not, right? So if that's the case, that's why it's extremely important that you pray and tell the Lord, Lord, you don't want my family member, my friend, to burn in hell, right? And you have to claim that promise. And when you claim that promise, as you pray to him, then he can answer that prayer even better. Look at 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all. Did it say all? Yeah, if it says all, then he means all. All should come to repentance. So it's important that you got to be praying because the Lord, he believes that uh, he believes in that statement where he doesn't want anyone to burn in hell. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Another one. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look at verse 1 and then we'll look at verse 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and we'll look at verse 1. And we'll look also at verse 4. The Word of God states that we got to be praying for everybody. Now you might say, why would God want us to pray for everybody? The reason why is because He wants all of them to be saved. We're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And you'll notice right here what the Word of God says. In verse 1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications and what? Prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for, notice, all men. Why? Because he wants all men to be saved. Verse 4, who will have all men to be what? Saved and to come unto the what? Knowledge of the truth. They thought that you're crazy when you tell them the truth. But God wants them to know the truth. So the thing is, pray. And when you pray, the Lord will do things. If you haven't been praying, I'm going to tell you one thing, all right? This is extremely important. I don't care how many videos you watch from us or from other people. I don't care how much Bible you know, and I don't care how well you argued your faith or do it in an innocent way. It's not going to work without prayer. Amen. So if you haven't been praying, you better start praying. All right, the third thing, we're going to look at the book of 1 Corinthians 9. First Corinthians, and then we'll look at chapter 9, chapter 9, First Corinthians chapter 9. Now, you, the Word of God states that when we witness to people, and I think this is a problem with a lot of people, is that because we are so much enriched in knowledge of the Bible, amen, because we're so much enriched with the knowledge of the Bible, we think that anything we say and do can be a compromise to the faith. But no, that's not the case. What God wants you to do is this. What God wants you to do in your Christian life, which is what Paul says, he says, I must be to uh, all means to all men. Why? So that I might win some. It is important that in your Christian life that you live that way because that way the people, uh, they think in your Bible-believing Christian life, what they will think of you in your Bible-believing Christian life is that you are too strict, you're too rigid, and that they have to meet down to your level. Now, let's be honest, church. 
because you live your life as a Bible believing Christian, don't, isn't there a large gap between you and the world? Yes, there's, there is an extremely large gap between you and the world. So you got to realize this. They're not like you. They're not like you where they had a heart to begin with to seek after truth. So because they never had that heart to begin with, to seek after truth, you got to realize this, is that because they never had that to begin with, they're going to avoid you even more. They're going to avoid you even more when you show them the King James Bible issue, Bible believing truth. And then some of you might talk about conspiracies and they might think that you're crazy, right? So that might not be a good start. With some people, it might be other people. It might not be, though, you got to understand. So you got to meet down to their level. It's important that you compromise. As Bible believers, we automatically assume that we cannot compromise. Here's the thing. You cannot compromise into something in doing what's wrong. But if it's not wrong, then you should compromise as much as possible. Why? Because you got to meet toward their standard so that you can understand what they're thinking, what they're going through, and eventually win them to Christ. Why? Because otherwise I would not be a pastor here anymore. The reason why I survived here as a pastor, and you got to realize this, is people already think that I'm nuts and they avoid me. People think that I'm extreme already. But I believe this is that because uh, the Lord, he brought me, I strongly believe this. Because I went through Berkeley and I studied under there, I was able to understand the thinking of the worst kind of liberals, the extreme kind of liberal. So because of that, I knew which subject to talk with, with the uh, atheists and even professors and even sodomites. I go down to their level, to their understanding, and then I tell them I know what they're talking about and I've learned that in schools. But what I do after that is that I show them one by one, step by step, what's wrong with it. And you got to do that with other people because they are not ex they are not grown or extreme like you. Because the reason why is because they are not Bible believing Christians. Another thing is this is that how people are is that because they have a total different mind and thinking than you are, sometimes it is good where you don't have to all the time uh, show them the Bible first to introduce the subject. Now that might go, oh, that's blasphemy, stuff like that. No, the reason why is because people are carnal, sold under sin. They are not spiritual. So that's why, think about this. So I give, uh, I give uh, credit to whom credit is due. Uh, Ray Comfort has a very, very uh, brilliant method to get people to listen. And you, he uses certain like uh, light shows. And think about it. How did you people watch us online, huh? Mm -hmm. See? Think about it, Dr. Ruckman, how he's known in his town is not because of his intelligence or the King James Bible issue actually in Pensacola. You'd be surprised. You know what he's known for? Oh, the guy who draws. Because when you witness to people, they'll say, oh, that, that guy who draws. See, why? Because fleshy minded people are gonna remember something fleshy. It doesn't matter. How many souls have I led to Jesus Christ's salvation compared to you? Amen. See, the point is be all things to all men that you might win some. Amen. There are missionaries who went to China and they weren't stubborn in their own style of preaching or in their culture or in their speech or how their family methods were or in their dressing and conversation was. Because Hudson Taylor, for example, what he did was that these Chinese people, they disdained these Caucasian Europeans. And because why? The, they, they automatically stereotype, oh, colonization. So Hudson Taylor, what he did was this, is that he got himself a pigtail and then he dyed his hair black, put himself in Chinese dressing. And can you imagine how awkward he felt? <laughs> what in the world? But not only that, you know what's even worse? His fellow brethren made fun of him. So he was isolated by himself. But when he did that, the Chinese people, they opened their hearts to him. That's why his mission succeeded at the end, not other people, see? So people, I mean, it does make a difference to meet down to their level. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I, I know I went a long time on that preaching, but I'm stressing that. It really works. It really works. I'll give a warning too. I'll give a warning, but let's start off with this, okay? 
Verse 18, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Verse 20, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I may gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law to them that are without law as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means, what? Save some, and this I do for what? The gospel's sake. So I can't stress you enough that it is so important to do that. So the, the, now the limitation, let me stress this again. The limitation is if it causes you to sin. And when it causes you to sin, I don't care if it's going to get your loved one saved. It's still wrong. Sin is sin. Don't you dare do it. So that's why Billy Graham is in the wrong. I don't care what people say he's doing all things to all men that he might win some. That don't matter. All right, because don't you think God knows what he's doing with salvation of souls, not you? So if God says don't do this, then don't do it. That's it. So it's important that you live your life in compromise. As long as what? As long as it doesn't lead to sin. So let me also give a warning right here too. Sometimes, uh, uh, I'm for it too, sometimes when you preach hard, and you point out false prophets, it does work. People will pay attention. There are street preachers who do that. There are preachers who do that in churches and in online. My dad, he never was known until he actually pointed out false pastors. That's when people start to come to his church. So sometimes, you know, uh, shocking things, because the Bible is shocking, isn't it, anyways? Sometimes gimmicks, sometimes compromising works, but here's the limitation when it leads to sin. So if you're a street preaching jerk who's saying shocking stuff so that you can draw on a crowd, oh, I'm doing this to draw on a crowd so they can pay attention to my preaching, let me tell you something, you ruined your testimony already because they think you're a jerk. Mm -hmm. So that ain't gonna work. Ray Comfort, for example, you can do gimmicks all you want, but trust me, then you're wasting God's money on giving out money, and then when you start giving the gospel after you do a quiz game and give out money, then they start leaving. See, so the thing is this, is that compromise as long as it leads them to the gospel. But if it leads them to be more fleshy, prone, and sinful, then you better put a limitation to that. That's what I even do online too. I put a limitation where I, what? I would preach or teach something controversial, or even I would, dare, I would tell them to unsubscribe, right? I would do that. Why? Because the thing is, I don't depend on internet like some pastors do. You think you fall apart without internet. Me, I'll do fine. I'll do fine. If I'll draw, I'll draw a different board at a different area without the internet. And if God takes away the board, then I'll find something else to do to lead people to the Jesus Christ. For now, it's the internet. And trust me, internet don't last forever. Mm -hmm. Trust me, there's going to be more videos out there, and then we might not be as popular anymore. See? It's just that the Lord timed things right. That's right. So you just find those things, those opportunities that you can use to bring people to Jesus Christ. And trust me, don't depend on those things. Trust the God who gave you those things. Because if you depend on those things, all, everything is world and temporary and they all turn to dust. All right, I spent a lot of time on that one, I apologize, but that is really important to understand about people out there. Maybe that's why you haven't been leading them to salvation. So you gotta try something like this, all right? That there's, be innovative, creative. Now look at Matthew 13, Matthew 13. All right, I better talk really fast now. All right, let's look at Matthew chapter 13. The fourth thing, now people have a hard time with this, but this is extremely important. You need patience. You need patience. Now people, they don't have patience. And I guess I can somewhat understand because I'm in that shoe too. It's tempting to do wrong things. Now, the person, they might reject Jesus Christ. They might not listen to you. But I'm going to tell you this. What's really important to understand is that just because your loved one rejected the gospel after you talked to them the third time, and it's only been one year after you witnessed to them, if you get easily discouraged, uh, you can't act like that. That's uh, no offense, but that's actually being weak in heart. The reason why is this, uh, one, I pray, f there are family members, you gotta understand, that I've been praying for to get saved. Uh, even uh, 
for 30 years now. So you gotta understand this is that there's someone that some people that still won't get saved after 30 years. There are praying mothers who pray for years for their uh, children to get saved. And guess what? It took years. And guess what? Those children did get saved and they became missionaries. One of the mothers didn't give up praying for her child to get saved till the day she died. And her child still didn't get saved till the day she died. But after she died, the child got saved, actually. So you got to realize this. You got to have patience. If you get discouraged easily, then what's going to happen? The devil's going to use that discouragement to make you not witness anymore, to make you quit praying for them, to make you say, well, they're never going to get saved. That's what the devil wants. Look, if I thought that way when I pastored a church, guess what? You would not be here today. If I thought that way after one year or two years, especially after two years, and I'm like, oh, it's getting better, and then we drop to like one or three after that, and then I quit, then what? Especially people online probably wouldn't have gotten saved and people on the streets and the houses we knocked. you got to have this. Don't be impatient. All right, Matthew 13, verse 8. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Now, did you notice that? It grows, right? It grows with so much. But do you know how long? I'll tell you how long. We're going to look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Do you know how long? That's a lot of fruit, ain't it? Hundredfold, sixtyfold. The Lord blessed that with our church too, right? With our soul winning and the internet ministry and other things we've been doing as a church. Mm -hmm. But do you know when that happened? After nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. All right, now look at Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Look what the Bible says. We're going to look at verse 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with what? Patience. Now remember that. If you want them to get, if you want a miracle where someone's going to get saved, it's not going to come unless you learn this. And trust me, to God, who's, trust me, your God is very patient. You know why he's very patient? He lived for eternity before he created man. He's a very patient God. He wants you to go by that kind of timetable, not with mankind's timetable. I know how, how annoying that is, but trust me, if you don't have this in your life, the devil will use impatience to not just damn your loved one to hell where you give up on them, but even in your own life, he's going to be watching you what you're impatient on and take advantage of that to make you make a wrong decision. I can't stress that enough. All right. Number five, 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. So let's finally close right here. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. And we will look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. Now, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you know. And it doesn't matter how much you try with people. If you get discouraged and they don't get saved, let me tell you something. Don't get discouraged. I notice this with even hardcore Bible-believing preachers, which is a great disappointment to me. The thing is, is that because they think that they're the best prospect to win their loved one to salvation and their loved one won't get saved, they feel like they have to compromise more, think harder or pray harder or do something harder to get that person saved and they get stressed, they get worried and they lose heart and hope. Now you gotta realize this, okay? Is it ultimately you or is it ultimately God? Isn't it God? Amen. All right, then why are you panicking? Yeah. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. I have planted, right? You really planted with patience, right? So that you can get 100 fold, 60 fold, but it won't come. And not only that, other people have done it. Apollos watered. Pastor preached the gospel. I planted hard. I, and pastor preached the gospel. They still won't get saved. But what? God that giveth the increase. God's the one that gives the increase, not you and I. We're just doing small parts. So don't worry and trust in God. 
So this is very important to follow on how to win your lost loved one to salvation. Sometimes they can be stubborn, but guess what? You got to realize this, is that with God, all things are possible. Amen. And weren't there murderers who got saved? Amen. Weren't there atheists who got saved? Weren't there rich people who got saved? What makes you think that your case is a very special exception where it's impossible and the person won't get saved? 